Good evening. Very nice to be here, and uh, very nice to see Matthias again. And uh, uh, actually, Sonia and I have worked together on issues here in the Northeast and Massachusetts uh, for many, many years. Um, but when we discovered we were both going to be here at the same time, we decided that rather than I tell you something and then she tell you the same thing, that we should divide the world up a little bit, the climate issue. It's big enough to be divided. We decided to divide it by scale. And I'm going, to, I'm going to take the international piece. Um, I'm at the Fletcher School, which is a graduate school of international environment, resource policy, that's what I work on, but we do a lot of other, other uh, international things. It, uh, the full name is the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. And, um, uh, and, and, uh, and uh, I'm going to talk a bit about the diplomacy of climate change uh, this, uh, this evening. And, if you've been following this at all, you all know that in December there was a big meeting in, in Doha, in the Middle East, of all the parties to the Climate Convention, which is basically every member of the United Nations is actually a signatory and a party to the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. Um, just a little, by way of a little background, you may have covered this, those of you who are taking uh, the course in, in class, but let me just kind of do a little, a little background here for a moment. Um, in 1992 was the, the Rio Earth Summit, as it was called, the UN Conference on Environment and Development. And actually unrelated to that, but using that as a kind of a deadline, because believe it or not, it is not just students who procrastinate. It is not just faculty members who procrastinate. Diplomats procrastinate and they need deadlines. So the deadline was, we're gonna have this treaty ready to go at Rio. Because the Rio meeting still stands as the largest gathering of heads of state and heads of government in the history of the world. There were 154 or something, uh, you know, prime ministers, kings, uh, presidents, whatever, whatever potentate you have in your country, uh, he or she was there. And so the idea was, and in, in international treaties, as a chemist, I found this fascinating when I got to the law, the School of Law and Diplomacy. Uh, first of all, you get a big celebration because the treaty's been written. It doesn't mean a thing. Then countries sign it. Hardly means a thing. Then they have to ratify it. In the United States, that means the president must get the advice and consent of two thirds of the members of the Senate to say, yeah, go ahead, we'll do it. And other countries, I guess, the, you know, the local dictator just decides, or, you know, but they're all different, probably, or whatever the country is. But anyway, and it had to be that 60 countries ratified it for it in force. And often it takes decades for these treaties to be ratified. What was amazing about the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change was it was signed, no, there's never been a signing by 154 heads of state in the world before. They all signed it right there. So the first step was done. They took it back to their countries. Um, George Bush the first was our president at the time. He was there and he signed it. He brought it back. He submitted it to the Senate for its consideration in June when he came back. In October, the Senate ratified it unanimously. How easy is that? <laughs> I mean, we still haven't ratified the non-binding, you don't have to do anything about it, just say it's a good thing to do. You know, the Convention on the Rights of the Child. We haven't done that. It took us 30 years to ratify the Genocide Treaty. Um, but this took four months. And we were, the, we were the, uh, the fourth nation to ratify. The three who beat us were small island nations who were afraid of being swamped by, the, by rising sea level. But we were the first big country, the first developed country, and we led the way. By March, 60 countries had ratified. It's unheard of. It just doesn't happen that fast. So the treaty enters into force um, one year after the 60th country ratifies. And over year, the years, every single country in the world, at least that's a member of the United Nations, uh, has ratified. So um, that and the Montreal Protocol of the is over there, the only two treaties that have universal membership. So a year later, they have a meeting in March in, in, um, in, in, March in uh, Berlin. And they decided this, this treaty is great. It says, do the right thing. Climate change is a problem. We should meet every year to talk about it. Um, we should report our emissions. 
Um, yeah, it's a problem. Um, the goal of this treaty is to stabilize greenhouse gas in, uh, concentrations in the atmosphere uh, to avoid anthropogenic interference with the climate system. And that's the grand language. Pretty clear once you get over stumbling over anthropogenic. Um, so basically, here we are, we're all set. And so they meet, and they say, yeah, we've got to do something. So they start planning something which became known as the Kyoto Protocol, which actually said the United States will reduce by this much, and Great Britain by that much, and so forth. And what do we do about developing countries? Well, you know, they're still trying to develop. Maybe you ought to cut them a little slack. And uh, so that's what was done. Uh, they, they, they were, um, <coughs> But they agreed to, to, to work on it and try to slow their emissions growth, uh, but they didn't have quantitative targets. Only the so-called developed countries had those. Well, just shortly before going to, to Kyoto, uh, in the summer before, the US Senate had a vote. It was a non-binding Senate resolution, a message to then for right now President Clinton. Uh, this is 1997. Uh, President Clinton, do not go to Kyoto and come back with a treaty unless it requires that countries like China and India reduce their emissions at the same rate as the United States does in the same time frame. It was a poison pill. I mean, absolutely impossible for them to do. And uh, made sure that the U.S. would never uh, ratify the Kyoto Protocol. Now, they didn't say anything more. But the vote on that, this is just five years after unanimously approving the climate treaty saying this is a serious problem. Five years later, 95 percent is the vote. Every senator, your senators and mine, here from Massachusetts. One of our senators actually was the manager of this bill on the floor. This is going to be the next Secretary of State. <laughs> <laughs> but I won't name him. <laughs> uh, what happened? What happened in between was that uh, the automobile industry and the coal industry and the oil industry and the natural gas industry and a bunch of other heavy chemical industries joined in something called the Global Climate Coalition. Now, if you've ever read George Orwell, you realize this is an Orwellian <laughs> name, right? You know, uh, what, 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 what did uh, they say? What did Orwell's book say? Uh, you know, this is a time when good is bad and love is hate and war is peace. Well, the Global Climate Coalition was war on, climate, on, on doing anything about climate. It was not about fixing the climate problem. And there was a very clever lobbying effort which convinced every member of Congress that this would be a disaster for Americans. I'm still trembling in my boots over being taken over by Indian industry because they can do it so much better and faster than we can. It's really a scary thought. China, of course, is another matter. Uh, they seem to be doing quite well and they're uh, able to move pretty fast. But if you look at what China's doing today and you look at what we're doing today, China is moving much more rapidly to reduce their emissions and the intensity, the carbon intensity, the emissions that go with their industrial production much more rapidly than we are doing. Their current, uh, they have five-year plans there. We, we, can't, we can't plan for the first week of January when we go over the fiscal cliff, right? But the Chinese actually plan for five years ahead. And they have a plan. They will reduce their carbon intensity by 45% uh, by the end of five years from now. And they actually beat their previous target, which was for the last five years. So it's quite impressive what the Chinese can do in the months later. So the U.S. has become a barrier to getting an agreement. The developing countries are a barrier to getting a universal agreement because it's very clear at the time of the, of the Kyoto Protocol, um, uh, developed countries were responsible for about two thirds of all of the, the, the greenhouse gas, the heat trapping gases going into the atmosphere. The developing countries, including China and India, for about one third. Well, today, it's about uh, between 55 and 60% are coming from developing countries. Only 40% is coming, a little bit 40% is coming from Europe, the US, Japan, uh, Australia, New Zealand. So things have changed dramatically. 
And it's very clear there's been a whole lot of huffing and puffing and pushing and shoving diplomatically. And finally, in Durban a year ago, and then reconfirmed in Doha last year, that the next round would require the developing countries to take on some emission reduction uh, management responsibilities. Now, we haven't seen the we haven't seen the treaty yet. But I don't know if you recall back a few years ago with the conference in, in Copenhagen that had everybody's expectations up. And we were gonna have the big, big deal there, everybody was gonna do something, and all that happened was people stood in line in freezing cold weather in Copenhagen got cold feet. And there was this uh, really bizarre moment when President Obama gave his speech after accepting uh, the uh, Nobel Peace Prize and uh, then he came to Copenhagen and he gave a speech there. He got on his airplane, was called back, came back to the meeting because nothing was going to happen. And he stormed around till he found where the president of China was, broke into the room where the president of China was meeting with the president of Brazil and South Africa and, um, and um, India. And, uh, and said, we gotta, we gotta put something out. And so they put out a statement that said, we'll all try harder, and we promise to volunteer to do the following things, and then there were two blank pages to be filled in here. <laughs> so this has been a pretty disappointing process, this international process. And I have to say, I, my, I started on climate change on January 1st, 1988, because that's when my job started, as the first director of the climate program at the World Resources Institute in Washington, D.C which is a think tank, policy, workshop place, so forth, that at times has been very influential on, on all kinds of uh, policies related to the environment and resources. And at that time, Gus Speth was the president. He uh, uh, later was the head of the UN Development Program, and then uh, he, he had been uh, uh, Jimmy Carter's um, uh, head of the Council of Environmental Quality and done a whole bunch of things in his life, an amazing person. <laughs> and us and the rest of us all just thought, well, you know, this is it. This is how we're going to do it. You know, 1988, things are moving. World Resources Institute was out in front. We would, we would hold briefings for members of Congress and their staffs, and we would have 150 sold out, couldn't fit any more people in the room, would come over to hear about climate change. And yes, there were Republicans as well. I also to remind you that George Bush himself, when I last looked, if he hasn't yet been expelled from the Republican Party, the first George Bush was a Republican president. So it was a different world, and it had not been polarized politically the way things are now. We just said, you know, the way it's going to work is there's going to be this grand agreement among all the governments of the world, and we're all going to agree to what our obligations are, and every government will go home from that meeting, and they will enact domestic legislation increase the fuel efficiency of cars, um, shift away from fossil fuels, whatever it takes to get our emissions down. It hasn't happened. In fact, this moment of the Bernard Hagel resolution, as it was called in the Senate, is kind of a, kind of a bellwether moment when things changed in the United States. And at that time, the US was the leading producer of these gases. We're now only second, a paltry second. So where are we now? Well, out of Doha, they agreed that by 2015 we'll have something, and it will enter into, <coughs> and we'll have it all working by 2020. But the Europeans and the Australians said, "We're going to continue the Kyoto Protocol." It, it, by the way, its obligations ended December 31st, so we went over the climate cliff at that moment. And the legislation that replaced it, the treaty that replaced it. Is Kyoto 2, which a small number of European nations and Australia have agreed, their emissions amount to 15% of the world's heat trapping emissions. Well, that's the only thing at that level that's working right now. That's where it is. It's kind of sad. So, what I'm here to tell you is, as sad as that is, I think I understand why it hasn't worked. A lot of people have written about why, why they've been unable to make anything work. Let me just 
to start by saying, I'm going to, I'm going to just state that I believe that the process of trying to set targets and timetables for countries, of focusing on the emissions, has failed. 20 years of trying, it has failed. We've been unable to do much of anything. And my question is, why, with all the goodwill that went into getting this going, has it failed? Well, various people have suggested various kinds of things. But let me give you the analysis that we have. And I have some copies of this paper up here. If people would like some copies, I've got a whole bunch of them in a bag there. Um, it's, it's a paper that I published uh, with a, with a, uh, uh, a, uh, a former doctoral student of mine, Mihailo Papa, uh, that we, we had published just, it came out just a year ago. And I would argue that the reason that we've not been able to get a climate treaty based on pollution control is because we're negotiating the wrong treaty. We have misdiagnosed the problem. We think it's a pollution problem. We talk about it as an environmental problem. I don't think it's that. Let me tell you why. Here are five quotations of government leaders over the past several years. Quote, we will not cut our development potential. Our life, number two, our lifestyle is not up for negotiation. It would cost us jobs and damage our industry. It would have a negative impact on the living standards and for the competitiveness and for our businesses. Fifth one, a more ambitious target would constrict our development space. When diplomats get together, they talk about burden sharing. When the heads of state and so forth get together, they talk about how this will infringe on their development. So the first one, we will not cut our development potential. That's uh, Dmitry Medvedev, president of Russia at the time. The second one, our lifestyle is not up for negotiations. I heard a titter go through the audience. Yes. It is us. <laughs> George Bush. <laughs> the first. Um, it would cost us jobs and damage our industry. Uh, Prime Minister John Howard of Australia. Um, uh, uh, it would have a negative impact on the living standards and for the competitiveness and for our businesses. That is the um, uh, Environment Minister of Poland. And the last one, a more ambitious target that constrict our development space, is Jairam Ramesh of India. So it doesn't matter whether it's a developing country, an economy in transition, or a developed, first-rate, developed country, they all say the same thing. Right? We cannot afford to address climate change because it will harm our economy, our industry, our, industry, our jobs, or whatever it is. And we hear this over and over again. What does this presume? It presumes that more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere equals more growth in GDP. Well, along with the pollution that, say, we're seeing from burning coal in China today, it probably does increase the GDP to have all those sick people who have to be treated, which then gets added to the GDP. But I don't think that's a constructive way to build GDP. I'm not even sure GDP is the right measure to be using here. But this, this myth that people have in their mind that more carbon dioxide, more emissions, means more development is one of the first big hang up here. And so as long as we characterize this as a pollution problem, obviously, we learned this back in the 70s when we began to do our own clean air and clean water work, it does cost more if you keep doing things the same polluting way and then pay to clean it up at the end of the pipe. It does cost more than just doing it and leaving it dirty. That should not be a surprise to anyone. But if you rethink what you're doing and say we have to develop this way, our economy have to function putting out all this pollution or all this carbon dioxide, is there a way to have an economy, to have an industry that doesn't do that, then why can't you have development that way? So reframing this as a development issue is hugely important. 
we call, we actually refer to this now as sustainable development diplomacy. It is that we are doing unsustainable development in the most profound meaning of that term. We are developing our economy in a way that cannot continue, and yet we persist. And we did so many things in the last 20 years to make the problem worse in the United States. Just policy after policy. Right now, we are so excited that we have access to so much natural gas. And we can waste it as we bring it out. And it's a heat trapping gas, too. And we're just so excited we have all this. And we're going to be rich. We're going to be the Saudi Arabia of the world in terms of natural gas. Never mind that it's going to end up making the planet uninhabitable. But that's, that's a different story. We'll worry about that later, maybe. So I see emissions as a symptom rather than an underlying problem. They're a symptom of unsustainable development. Secondly, think of yourself as being a negotiator. You go to this negotiation in Copenhagen or Doha or wherever it is, and you get a deal, and you come back, and you say to your foreign minister or your head of the State Department, whatever it is, Secretary of State, and then announce to all of your fellow citizens, my fellow citizens, I have brought you back the following burden to share. <laughs> you should be really pleased that I brought you this big chunk of burden to share. Right? That's how we're going to address climate change. That's how we're trying to address climate change. I mean, it's, it's, it's absurd when it's stated that way, but that's exactly what is, what is being done. So, um, there's actually a lot of research that's done on what makes for a successful negotiation. It is seldom successful to have a negotiation that focuses on negatives, about what you cannot do. Let me tell you what you cannot do. Let me restrict your freedoms. And this is what I've brought you as a burden to share in damaging your economy and everything else. It just is, a, it's, a just not a, it's just not a winning strategy. So I would argue that this approach is never going to get us there. The, the use, the utility of it is that the leaders of the world have all said, we have a problem. This is what the problem is. It's climate change. Not that we're going to do anything about it, but we, you, you, know, you should understand that we do have a problem, and we recognize that. And so how do we move on from that particular point? And fortunately, I think there is a way. And, and all of the studies that have been done on all kinds of negotiations, going back to the work uh, that Roger Fisher did in his little book, Getting a Yes. Let me just address the moment here to tell a story. I uh, was uh, back in uh, 1994, a group of six, uh, eight of us, uh, were doing a joint project funded by the United States and the Netherlands. Uh, we were going to uh, we're going to use the U.S., the Netherlands, as the developed countries, and we're going to try to do um, what we ended up doing. Nobody was home in Russia at the time, so we couldn't get an answer. So we did Ukraine, um, we did Brazil, we did India, we did China. And uh, one, another fellow and I from China as our thing. So we got to interview all these amazing people in China, people in, in the energy ministry, the head of the energy ministry, in fact, and uh, uh, people in the... Um, the forestry ministry and people in the coal ministry and all of these people and asked them, this is 1993, four, you know, what do you guys think about climate change? Well, they didn't laugh at us. Uh, they said, well, we, we, you know, our scientists say it's a problem, but our political leaders say we've got to keep developing. Okay, fine, and so what are you doing? We just got this whole thing. And so I, I got to go interview the um, deputy minister for treaty compliance in the foreign ministry. And I was ushered into his office and uh, formalities and so forth. And we were talking about various things. And I tried to use some of Roger Fisher's getting to yes tactics here. And I said, well, you know, there's some wonderful things that could happen here. I mean, you know, China is really beginning to, to grow economically. But uh, the, if I may say so, the use of energy in this country is pretty inefficient. And if, if you could improve the efficiency of energy use, you would also be addressing climate change. And he'd been looking at me rather sternly. At this moment, his face lit up, and he said, ah, a win-win situation. <laughs> Page 31, Roger Fisher. <laughs> I was so impressed. Anyway, we had a wonderful discussion after that. It was, it was, it was just great. 
This notion of a mutual gain is hugely important and hugely undervalued. If you're the biggest kid on the block or the biggest government on the block, you sort of think you can get any other kid on the block or any other government on the block to do what you want them to do because you'll knock their block off if they don't. So if you're richer and have a bigger military, you feel as though I'm the powerful one here, you do what I say. But that's not how things get done. And whenever those kind of agreements are put in place, they are seldom successful. Because eventually, the person who's been intimidated into saying yes just doesn't do it. You know, they don't live up to their end of the bargain. Well, when do you live up to an agreement that you have? I think it's pretty clear. It's when you get what you want and they get what they want. And this is called mutual gains negotiation, which was started by Roger Fisher and has been developed. And there's a whole institute now over at Harvard Law School called the Program of Negotiation which must have 10,000 cases on everything from, uh, from uh, uh, domestic negotiation to international relations and labor negotiations, everything in between. Uh, and it's very clear that when you have a mutual gain, that there's something in it for all parties, those, those become ne nearly self-enforcing agreements. Because I know that if I do what I said I'm going to do, You'll do what you're going to do. You said you were you going to do, and I really wanted you to do what you're going to do. So therefore, I'm going to do what I said I'm going to do. And it's amazing how many how much more effective those agreements are. So in this paper, we kind of go through a little bit of the arguments about all that, and then we we say, well, what what kind of an agreement could this become that would be mutually satisfying? to both developed countries and developing countries, to European countries and the United States, um, to the Japanese, um, uh, to, to, to Africans living in poverty and Indians living in poverty. What, what, could, what could happen? And there have been some articles written about what we ought to do is forget about trying to control emissions and let's just get, you know, let's just invest in clean energy. The problem with that is it's too unfocused. What do you mean clean energy? Well, energy that doesn't emit heat trapping gases. Turns out if you think about it and, and you look at, uh, say, work of people like Amy Lovins, who I think first uh, introduced this concept, people don't really want energy. They know they need energy for development. We all know that. For our economy to function, we have to have energy. No matter what level we are, whether we are the poorest farmer in, uh, in, in, uh, um, in, in, in Mali, which is in huge chaos these days, or whether we are living comfortably in the city of Boston. Here, we need energy. Lights. Wait. We need light. As a form of energy. How do we light those lights? We'd like to have this something on the screen. If we want something on the screen, we need electricity. Um, but we don't need lumps of coal to get that light. We don't need fracking huge areas of the United States to get that light. Light is a, an energy service. It is a service that we want. We want light, we want comfort, we want mobility. We want to have energy to manufacture certain goods, to provide certain services. Does it matter to us where the energy comes from to do that? The problem is all energy policy is decided top down. Well, we produced this many tons of coal last year, we will produce this plus 5% next year. That's energy planning. It's all from the top down. It's where do we start? What do we start with? Not what do we need? You know, even though these are very efficient lights, I can tell by looking at them, uh, uh, they are probably only converting about two, maybe three percent of the energy from the burning of the coal that ran the power plant that put this here. That means 97 percent of the carbon dioxide emitted by that coal, coal plant didn't do a bit of good. That's pretty shocking. When you get in your car and drive, at best, 
you get 20%, or typically 15% of the energy in gasoline goes to move your car. The rest is just heat. Well, you know, you got to get And in fact, we have, to, we have to build in a cooling pump and fans and everything else to keep the car from overheating. So 80%, you know, so many things in the world are the 80-20 rule, right? Well, this is another 80-20 rule. So 80% of it is just wasted. It's just not even there. So 80% of the carbon dioxide that comes out of your tailpipe did not move your car forward. Now, if you had an electric vehicle, 80% of the energy in that electric motor would move your car forward, and only 20% would be heat. So there's another way to do it. You can deliver that service in a much more efficient way with much less waste and much less greenhouse gases, much less carbon dioxide from power plants. Most dramatic example I know, and I know it's unfair because I can't think of any other one that's this good, but let me tell it to you anyway. Uh, this is for a developing country. Um, a colleague of mine at the, at the Lawrence Berkeley lab named um, Ashok Gadgil, who was born in India, uh, trained as a nuclear physicist, but he has said has become a, a physicist who works on, uh, on renewable energy now. And he went back to India a few years ago, maybe 10 or 12 years ago, and went to his village, as my Indian colleagues always say, meaning even if they had lived in an urban setting for two or three generations, they always have a village from which their family originally came. And he was, he was pleased to see that the villagers had learned that they had to boil the water to make it safe to drink. What did they boil it with? Firewood. They had deforested an area for several miles around the village, gathering firewood to boil the water and to cook their meals. And he said, there's got to be a better way. So he went back to Berkeley and he thought about that. He said, it has to be simple. It has to be usable by anybody. And he invented a device, which is basically, for a single household, it might be a box about the size of this. For a village, it could be the size of from there to there. Galvanized metal box, filled with water in the morning. It has a single ultraviolet lamp in the side on the top. One solar panel on top, and by noontime, the water is bacteriologically clean. It uses one one thousandth as much energy as the firewood to boil the water. It produces zero carbon dioxide. The service is safe water. That's development. And by the way, it's also, you don't have all the soot and the smoke and the everything else that goes with putting firewood, right? It's just, it's a, it's a miracle. You just put, you know, you just put it in. It's like your iPhone. You know, you just pick it up and turn it on and it works. We need more things like that. So it is possible to do development, even at the, at the most basic level, to get people on the first step of the ladder to getting decent energy services that provide them a better life that do not contribute to climate change. So they don't have to contribute to climate change in order to have a better life. They can have a much better life uh, without that. So that's basically uh, our proposal, was to let's start there. Let's start with energy. Let's start with energy services for all. It's a practical program that the Secretary General of the UN has proposed. But let's, he says, what we want to do is to double the amount of renewable energy, double the efficiency, and that's as far as he goes, he should say, and cut in half the carbon dioxide emissions associated with energy production. So this idea we put out and it's gotten a little purchase, and let's say there are copies of this over here, which I'll put out afterwards if you're interested in seeing this. Um, but negotiating the wrong treaty will not get us to a climate treaty. Now, I get tired of talking about how dismal this whole process is, which is one of the reasons I have to look at this and say, isn't there some other way? And secondly, we began looking around and seeing that there are, in fact, things happening. They just aren't happening as a result of national governments or national governments working together. And um, some of these are, are individuals. In fact, let me just, uh, seeing all of you here, uh, we're having a big event at, uh, at, at Tufts on the 25th of January, 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, a man named Alan Savory, 
who was, uh, was born in Rhodesia, which doesn't exist anymore, it's now Zimbabwe, uh, was a uh, park ranger in Kruger National Park in South Africa, sort of grew up as a, as a young man, young man on as a South African, um, had moved back to Zimbabwe, started a research station there to figure out how to restore the, the totally desertified, damaged grasslands uh, that had been overgrazed. Just turned into woody places you can't, you can't, no cow can survive on. And he has found a way to manage using livestock to restore these lands. Because as he said, there is no, it, it, one thing he discovered is yes, there are a lot of lands that are overgrazed, but when you fence them off and say we're going to let them recover, they never recover as grasslands. Because grasslands and grazing animals evolve together. There's a synergy between them. And he said, we can actually mimic that with livestock if we manage them the way wild grazing animals do, which is, you know, cows and domestic animals, sheep and goats, are like humans. They're dumb and lazy. <laughs> they stand there and they chew on the same blade of grass until all the grass is gone. Then they move on and chew the other one until it's all gone. Wild animals walk along, take a bite of this, take another step, take a bite of that. Why? Because there are predators out there. You can't stand there and just chew on that blade of grass, you'll get eaten. Cows don't figure that out. Sheep and goats don't figure that out. And they eat the last blade of glass, grass, the last leaf, whatever it is. So he's figured out a whole system of doing this. Anyway, he's going to be talking about it. He has some spectacular things. One of the things it does is it not only restores and reverses desertification, it stores vast amounts of carbon in the soils. And it does it from the moment you start the process. There are very few things that are pulling carbon dioxide out of the air. So anyway, he'll be talking about that at 2 o'clock on January 25th. Now let me just close by saying that I'm going to get a little transition to, uh, to Sonia's uh, presentation, which is the other place things are happening is below the national level. States, municipalities, there are over a thousand mayors in the United States who belong to mayors for climate change. They are working. Uh, you know, they're working to address climate change. Uh, Massachusetts and California are the lead states in the country in terms of addressing climate change. Uh, I was in New York uh, a year ago and heard Mayor Bloomberg say that uh, uh, between 2005 and 2011, New York City had reduced its emissions by 12%. A definite program to do so. That's where it can happen. Right? So, I think what Sonia's going to do is talk to us a little bit about what regions and uh, states and maybe municipalities are doing uh, to address climate change. And uh, if we can do it all in the, in the spirit of mutual gains and uh, good, uh, good energy services, clean energy services for all, I think we'll get them. <laughs>